I'm quite sure that all of you at one time have seen metamorphic rocks, especially if you've driven along Highway 69 or Highway 11 or some of the highways in central Ontario. You just couldn't miss them. All the rock cuts are metamorphic rocks. Some of you may also have them on your patios or as facing stones on fireplaces or on the outside of your, your houses. As well as being ornamental, metamorphic rocks are the most puzzling of rocks. Their interpretation requires a detailed knowledge of chemistry. And the geologists who do interpret them are the very elite of geological detectives. So this is a rather difficult program, a rather difficult subject to deal with. But try your hand at it. A full hour of metamorphic rocks. We've already looked at two of the three families of rocks. We've looked at the igneous, and then we looked at the sedimentary rocks. And the subject of today's program is the third group of rocks, the metamorphic rocks. And the metamorphic rocks are produced, in fact, from igneous and sedimentary rocks by pressure cooking them, by applying heat and pressure, and also by circulating hot, steamy fluids rich in dissolved chemicals through them. The igneous and the sedimentary rocks, then, are the starting point for the metamorphic rocks. And as you might expect, if one produces rocks from such a wide variety of original rocks, the metamorphic rocks are very, very varied in appearance. There are the gneisses, which are rather similar to the igneous rocks in appearance, insofar as they're very obviously crystalline. But they still preserve some layering in them, probably from the original sedimentary rock. Here is another gneiss with large blotches of garnet in it. These are schists. And the schists are characterized by the abundance of mica, which you can see reflecting. You're looking at mica cleavage plates. And then slate, which is familiar to you from roofing tiles is a metamorphic rock also. Here is an, another metamorphic rock related to the slates, in which there are these nodules of minerals which have grown in the rock. Then serpentine, this rather beautiful green-colored piece of serpentine, and related soapstone, from which the Eskimos make their carvings, is another metamorphic rock. Here is another, again, rich in garnets, Garnet's weathered out on the surface in this case. And then finally, here is another specimen with a large white eye, almost, of white feldspar, of plagioclase feldspar. So the metamorphic rocks then are very, very varied in appearance, varied because they begin from a variety of starting points. And in front of me here are three rocks that you're familiar with from the igneous and sedimentary rock units together with their metamorphic equivalents. First, here is basalt, formed of plagioclase, pyroxene, sometimes some olivine. Next to it is its metamorphic equivalent, a dark rock made up of the, dominantly of the mineral family amphibol, and therefore called amphibolite. This is limestone that you'll remember from the sedimentary rock program. And next to it, its metamorphic equivalent, which is marble. Marble is found in northern Italy in large quantities, and it's produced there also by the metamorphism of limestone. Finally, sandstone, another sedimentary rock. And its metamorphic equivalent, quartzite. 
record. The purpose of today's program then is to look at metamorphic rocks and to show you just how the original igneous and sedimentary rocks respond to the application of heat and pressure and of migrating hot fluids, steamy fluids rich in chemicals. Those are the three agents of metamorphism as we call them and we shall discuss how they affect the original rocks. We shall also look at the geological situations, the where, if you like, of metamorphic rocks. In what geological situations do um, metamorphic rocks occur? Where do the changes take place? We shall also look at how we can interpret the history of a metamorphic rock by looking at the characteristics of the hand specimens. What, to, for example, do those shiny plates of mica and the schists that we looked at tell us about the history of a metamorphic rock? What does the appearance of a marble tell us about the history of that metamorphic rock? We shall also look at the classification of metamorphic rocks in just the same way as we've looked at the classification of igneous and sedimentary rocks. Our main emphasis during the program will, of course, be on understanding the rocks rather than just putting them into pigeonholes. But as well as understanding the processes, we must understand the products and we must understand how to arrange the products, and that's the, the classification. The first kind of uh, metamorphic rock that we'll look at are the, those that we, we put in the class contact metamorphic rocks. The metamorphic rocks which have been affected by heat, and where would they be affected by heat? They'd be affected by heat adjacent to igneous intrusions. And we shall look first at an example of that kind of metamorphic rock, the contact metamorphic rocks. The dark rock is a... Still injected as a hot molten liquid at several hundred degrees centigrade between the layers of sedimentary rock. In this case, from radioactive dating, we know this event occurred at perhaps 1,500 million years ago and at a depth of maybe a mile beneath the surface of the earth. This covering of rock has now, of course, been removed. Um, as you might expect, the contact between this once molten rock and the cold sedimentary rock is quite interesting. The heat from the hot molten liquid baked the surrounding sedimentary rock, and where there were thin layers of sand and mud, new minerals have grown. The sand and the mud acted as the ingredients for these new minerals. On top of this outcrop, the upper surface of the sill is visible and shows an interesting pattern of contraction cracks. The contraction cracks are good evidence of the amount of cooling of that um, body of mol uh, originally molten material. The temperature was perhaps originally six, seven hundred degrees centigrade. The second piece of evidence of the originally high temperature of the molten material lies in the new minerals which formed in the bands of impurities. In this specimen of marble, you can see the same kinds of thing that was visible on the limestone on the margin of the sill at Elliot Lake. The dark bands are where the new minerals have grown in the originally impure bands in the limestone. The very white areas in the specimen represent areas where there were no impurities, and all that's happened is that the originally very small grains in the limestone have recrystallized and grown larger. The dark spots, such as here, are the spots of new minerals. And those minerals in this specimen and in the case at Elliott Lake are grains of the mineral pyroxene. Now, you've met pyroxene already. You've met it in the section on igneous rocks. And there you remember it was a mineral that crystallized out of a molten silicate melt, a mixture of elements and oxygen, silicon, tetrahedra, cool